Okay. Continuing where we left off, we have a look at some heterogeneous catalysis. Right now, we've only really looked at homogeneous catalysts, where catalyst and substrate are in the same phase. So they're both aqueous, both liquid. They're, they're essentially able to fully mix. Now, in a heterogeneous catalyst, usually the catalyst exists in a different phase of, from the substrate, typically as a solid. Well, these have their own disadvantages. It makes separation very easy. So you just essentially like, oh, it's a liquid fluidized bed. So you run the substrate over it, you drain it out, you've still got your callus bed, you can regenerate and reuse. Or you have a, you're essentially flowing a gas over it. You let you vent the gas off, then you reuse. So rather than focus on callus concentration, we have to consider instead absorption sites. So where are these going to interact within the our thing. So the first type of absorption is absorption while maintaining internal bonding, essentially called physisorption. So it's essentially the, the, the molecule binds onto the surface, but no chemistry is physically taking place. Uh, the, the dynamic equilibrium, essentially where we have absorption and desorption from the metal substrate, uh, metal catalyst. And we describe the rate of the gas or the liquid plus the uh, metal substrate. So the, the whatever the thing, gas or liquid, the substrate could be the K absorption to form a R, the complex metal substrate intermediate and KD, which is the desorption where it breaks off of K. And from there, we can see the reaction taking place. Now, the parameters for sur surface absorption is looking at a fractional coverage theta, which theta is the number of occupied sites over the total number of sites. How much complex is absorbed versus how many, what's the molar volume of this, the total number of, of all the sites. So if we have 100% absorption, and we have, we have 100 sites and 100 sites are filled, theta would be one, just a fractional absorption. Now, theta will vary with pressure of a gas at a fixed temperature, it's called the absorption isotherm. And we can describe this through by the Languir model. This model will make three approximations. Absorption is complete once a monolayer coverage is reached. All absorption sites are equivalent and the surface is uniform. And absorption and desorption are uncooperative processes. The occupancy state of absorption site will not affect the absorption or desorption probability for adjacent sites, saying essentially that putting one layer of gas on there will complete the absorption. We don't have to have two layers, three layers. We don't have to say multiple absorption to the same site. That there, you're not gonna say there's a difference between spot A and spot B. And most importantly is that when you absorb to spot A, spot B won't get a, a boost or spot B won't be hindered. You're not gonna have, worry about sterics from nearby spots. You're not gonna say that like in, in hemoglobin where you bind one oxygen, then the second one's easier to bind, the third one's even easier to bind, and the fourth one is the easiest of all to bind. Now we're gonna look at, they're all independent. So looking at this absorption process, fractional coverage increases with time as a function of absorption rate, pressure and the number of sites N, and the number of sites that are open, one minus theta. So essentially the change in the Fractional coverage is equal to the absorption times the pressure times the number of sites times one minus theta. So, so and desorption is just K desorption, negative K desorption, number of sites 
by sides times theta, the fractional coverage. So however many, if there's 100 sites and the fractional coverage is 50%, so you're saying 50 sites, the concentration 50 times the desorption. Now this one, around the pressure, say there's 100 sites, 50% covered, so that means there's 50 open times the pressure, so times the constant, which is essentially how much gas is there. So equilibrium, where the absorption rate of absorption and the rate of desorption is the same, add them up to give you zero. You can solve this in terms of, well, essentially we're gonna solve this in terms of uh, theta. Plugging that in, KD and you can say multiply Ka Pn to one and negative theta and add all the, the theta turns to the other side and have Ka Pn on one side. Factor out your theta and divide by this. So essentially your fractional coverage is equal to the absorption rate times pressure over the absorption rate times pressure plus the desorption rate. So if we say the number of equilibrium constant K, it's Ka over Kd, then we can say that theta is capital K times pressure over K times pressure uh, plus one. And now this is essentially the equation for the Langmuir isotherm. So if pressure is high enough, absorption is complete. So alternatively, if desorption rate is slow enough, fractional coverage is independent of pressure. So if desorption is slow, is if desorption rate is, zero, is close to zero, it doesn't matter how much pressure, Ka, times pressure, it's K over K, you get essentially 100%. Uh, so, but if pressure is high enough, if, if desorption is relatively fast at high pressure, we still overwhelm this term, plus, this plus one term. So, there's also the possibility of chemisorption, which is absorption accompanied by dissociation of the substrate. For example, hydrogen splits into two H atoms. So R2, a diatomic, plus two metal sides, splits into two metal binding sites. For chemisorption, essentially theta becomes Kp, K times P times one half plus one plus Kp is the one half, square root, essentially. It shows a weaker dependence on pressure. Now, how can this be used? This? We collect numerous Langmuir isotherms at different temperatures. We can plot natural log of K versus one over T for the Y and the X and determine what is the enthalpy of the absorption. So one thing we won't actually discuss is how real heterogeneous systems are different. Now we're going to get into a new topic here, radical chain reactions. Radical chain reactions are very complex gas phase reactions where unpaired electrons, we call it radicals, will form a series of cascading reactions to form numerous intermediates prior to product formation. In 1934, Rice and Hertzfeld were able to demonstrate that the kinetics of many organic reactions are consistent with radical reactions. They all involve three major steps, our initiation, propagation, many, many propagations, and a termination. Initiation is just forming the radicals for this. Propagation could be many different steps, but the radicals are essentially transferred, daisy chained from one to the other, keep this going, chaining with many, many steps together. And termination is how radicals are lost. Two radicals come together to form a neutral species. 
So one example is the decomposite, thermal decomposition of ethane into ethene and hydrogen, where small amounts of methane are also produced. The mechanism proposed by Rice and Hertzfeld is that first things first, we, we fragment this into two molecules of methyl radicals. Step two, a methyl radical collides with the ethane, forming a methane and a ethyl radical. So we extract a hydro, hydrogen radical form a neutral methane, and the ethyl radical can fragment off to form a hydrogen radical. Hydrogen radical can bump into more ethane to form hydrogen gas, and we can continue K3 and K4 and K3 and K4 and K3 and K4 on and on for the propagation. We only form that methyl one time. We only form, we're only going to form two molecules of methyl as long as for every one molecule of ethane we initiate. This K3 and K4 can keep going until we eventually have a termination where the ethyl radical and the ethyl radical and the uh, hydrogen radical bump into each other to reform our ethane and stops. You're not gonna have enough methyl radicals for that to happen, to like form methane and terminate like that. Now this mechanism looks incredibly complex. We have five different steps, but using a steady state approximation, this is only really a first order dependence on ethane. Let's look at that. So looking at the formate, the, the decomposition of ethane. Ethane is lost by the first step, K1. It is lost to the second step of ethane plus methyl radical. And it's lost to the fourth step or methyl radical with, with hydrogen radical plus ethane and it's reformed through the termination step. Now looking at the decay rates of ethane rather than the formation of product. So we'll need to define all three intermediates here. So methyl radical is formed twice from the first reaction and consumed by reaction two. So we're making a steady state that methyl radical doesn't dang around very long. So methyl radical is equal to 2K1 ethane over K2 ethane, which simplifies to just constants. And if you plug that in there, that becomes just 2K1 ethane. So we can add in those back together. So far we have three K1 ethanes. Ethyl radical and hydrogen radical have to be solved in terms of each other by summing both reactions because they both involve each other. So, so ethyl radical is K2 methyl times ethane, that's K3, itself uh, ethyl radical plus k4 methyl time i mean ethane times hydrogen radical minus k5 ethyl radical times hydrogen radical so we kind of have them in there and we're going to say hydrogen is k3 what ethyl radical k4 negative k4 ethane times hydrogen radical And uh, that's, that's how it gets lost. K5, uh, the ethyl radical times. So they're both equal to zero. S set them equal to each other and solve. So, so. K3 
came. K3. Okay. Okay. Basically here, I can set this guy equal to K3-ethyl and plug K3-ethyl radical, and plug that in to the bottom one. Now that bottom one, plugging that K3-ethyl, you have this new thing term now is added in K2-methyl radical ethane, K4-ethyl hydrogen gets canceled out and our two K our two termination steps add up. So now and we, remember we have K3, we have the CH3 in terms of 2K1 over K2, so that's 2K1 C2H6. So that so we now have these guys uh, uh, this hydrogen radical is now in terms of ethyl, uh, ethane over ethyl radical. Plugging that back in, plugging back in as we see, plugging that back in to our ethyl, ethyl radical. Ethyl radical, that right here, that cancels out. So K5, this becomes K1 C2H6. This last term, this becomes K1 K4 C2H6 squared over K5 ethyl radical. That stays K3 ethyl radical. That becomes K three K one methyl uh, ethane. So simplifying this down. So this is the only really term that's really ugly. K one ethane and two K one ethane simplifies to K one ethane. Get this to the other side. We well, essentially we have a quadratic. We have a quadratic. That, that we can get after we multiply by negative K3 ethyl. So we have ethyl squared, negative K1 ethyl ethane, what ethyl, what ethane ethyl radical K3 minus K1 K4 ethane squared over K5 K3. But you have to solve for the quadratic to get your what is the sum for our ethyl radical, but it's essentially ethyl times a whole ugly ass mess of, of constants. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that, but. But if the initiating step is a limiting step, it makes things a lot, 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 lot easier. Right? If the initiating step is much, much slower than K2, K3, K4, K5, then we can simplify that, that then let's see. This this whole term is the square root of K1, K4, K3 over K5 is the only thing of any significance times ethyl. Because K1 over K3, 2K3, is going to be really small. 
k1 over 2k3 squared is going to be even smaller. k1 times k4 over k3 times k5, we square root that, that's going to be somewhat significant. But plugging those in, so we have h1. And now we, well, now we have h1 in terms of where we can get rid of the ethyl radical. So plugging in ethane, uh, it's like ethane over this ugly ass mess, you get just a whole bunch of constants. All that essentially cancel out. So. K1 over K5, let's see. K1, so we, flip, we flip the places to take them into the parentheses. So if we plug this all in to the original first starting thing, our first look of ethane, this whole original first equation, we get that ethane equals K1 ethane, plus 2K1 ethane, plus a whole ugly mess of constants times ethane, minus a whole mess of ugly constants times ethane. Factoring all these in together, you essentially get 2K1 times ethane, K4, K3, K1, or K5, the square root of that, times ethane, which essentially K1 is really small, as we said, it's just a whole mess of constants times ethane. Whole mess of constants times ethane. because of the way these all cancel out. So despite the incredibly complexity and the different multiple of different rate constants, it's just ethane. Now, most orders are one half, one third, uh, one half, one, three halves, or two. So. Now, one other type of radical reaction of polymerization is which substrate chains together to form our long chains, forming a polymer out of many different monomers. Unlike our standard radical reactions, uh, the radical chain polymerization usually requires separate initiators and the product polymer site is not predetermined. So we have initiator, initiation step that forms two radicals. The radicals attach the monomer through a, the second initiation step. The propagation where a monomer radical attacks uh, a monomer to form a double monomer radical and then keep going where it propagates to form a three mob. Oh, and, and it just keeps going where we're saying m to the n minus one. So we don't know when it's going to stop. And eventually you have a termination step where some monomer and another monomer or radical come together and they stop. Now in this mechanism, the propagation rate is independent of the polymer size. It usually is. Looking at the change in the monomer radical, we ignore the propagation steps because they always form a new radical. So, we we'll really only need to look at our, how much initiator we put in, where we say our phi is the probability that our radical is generate, generates a monomer radical. So two phi ki i and negative two kt monomer radical squared. That's, so we're ignoring all the middle steps and just looking at the initiation step and the termination step. So under steady state approximation that we say that 
that the, the change in radical is essentially zero. We can say that our pro that m naught is square root of all this mess and half to i. So since monomer consumption is primarily in propagation, we can look at how does the monomer change rather than the monomer radical. So monomer changes by our kp monomer times monomer radical. And we've solved monomer radical in terms of i. So we have that the change in monomer is equal to a whole mess of constants times square root of the initiator times how much monomer we have. So we can actually calculate the chain length, what we call that new, by comparing the rate of monomer consumption versus the formation of new monomer radical. We're looking at the rate of monomer consumption, which is the Kp monomer radical monomer over consumption, uh, the formation of new monomer radicals, which was two phi Ki i. Depending on how fast we're forming new monomers versus how much monomer rate is being consumed, we can solve that in terms of, we solve that in terms of monomer radical. So plugging that in, that, that equals to 2k t monomer radical squared. Simply find down to the, the size of the chain depends on how fast is the propagation times monomer over two times the termination rate monomer radical. Plugging that in once again, because we have to, we can't, we don't know how much monomer radical is, but we do know how much initiator is. We get a simplification that we can control our chain length by how much monomer we have, knowing some of the constants and the square root of the initiator. So if you want a longer chain, you want more monomer, less initiator. If you want to create a shorter chain radical, we're going to have less monomer, more initiator. So by varying these two values, you can get different polymers of different chain length. You want, say, 5,000 Daltons or 10,000 Daltons or however many long chain you want. Vary that by saying how much new radicals we make versus how much you allow this to just react. And and look at explosions as well under this same kind of idea. Explosions are essentially caused by reactions in which the rate speeds up as time progresses rather than slowing down. So there are two major causes for explosions and there we can have two different reactions. Thermal runaway and chain branching reactions. Thermal runaway is when heat is formed through a highly exothermic reaction and there's not given enough time to sufficiently dissipate. Thus, temperature increases, and then this increases the rate constant K, which produces more heat as the reaction progresses, which increases K further, and it keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. Well, it was in a thermal runaway, so it's being produced too quickly. Chain branching, because most Fires are radical mechanisms. Chain branching is a radical mechanism where there's the potential to produce more radicals than are consumed. If the formation can occur more rapidly than the termination, we thus also have the explosion. So essentially, the kind of like a nuclear runaway when we nuclear energy, say we want every reaction uses one neutron to produce two neutrons. And if we one neutron is lost and but one neutron is contained and we keep reacting, then, then it doesn't matter. Then we can keep it at a steady state. But if two neutrons are absorbed and then we produce four neutrons and they're both absorbed and we produce eight neutrons and they're both they're all absorbed, 
we have a nuclear runaway and there's where we have the explosions. There's where we have the critical mass. So boom. So let's take a simple reaction, hydrogen plus oxygen goes to water. Now this seems really easy, but it's actually a really complex mechanism. Hydrogen plus oxygen forms two hydrox uh, hydroxy radicals. A hydroxy radical absorbs a hydrogen from the first water and a hydrogen radical. The hydrogen radical can attack an oxygen to form uh, another hydroxy radical and an oxygen. Uh, oxygen, a monoatomic oxygen diradical. The uh, monoatomic oxygen diradical can hit another hydrogen, form another hydroxy radical and a hydrogen radical. We could just have a hydroxy radical and a hydrogen radical form water, which is a termination step. And we can also have a hydrogen radical and oxygen radical instead of forming an OH, hit a third compound like nitrogen gas or just something else and form a HO2 radical. That's essentially going to be non-reactive at high pressure. So in most of these reactions, we either perform one radical or two radicals. So the formation of more radicals than consumed is an example of that branching reaction. These explosions are dependent on temperature and pressure. If temperature or pressure is too low, rate will not be sufficient to support appreciable chain branching. Thus, we'll see decay. So too low temperature, too low pressure, you bounce, you hit the wall, you are essentially, it dies. You don't keep reacting. If pressure is too high, we can have these three body reactions where you essentially form a stable HO2 radical. But once you get the second pressure limit, a thermal runaway occurs. So you see that red thing is our rate. If we get a, increase the pressure, ch -ch 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 -ch, shoots up, skyrockets. We have explosion because we essentially pressure is high enough that every collision is producing two or more radicals, two or more radicals, and like uh, one to two radicals, and then you keep making more and more and more and more and more, and, more and it just takes off. But once you hit pressure U. It's like, oh, now it's suddenly too high a pressure and it's no longer going to explode because we're going to hit that third gas that's going to make it. If you don't make a, if this stable radical forms, you've just terminated it and it's going to stop. But of course, when you get to a high enough pressure, thermal runaway occurs. It's just even though we are forming these stable radicals, you're generating too much heat to keep this together. So it's still gonna explode once we get to the p-thermal runway. Now, every chain branching mechanism can be simplified into three generic steps. Initial radical formation, A plus B goes to R. Radical, uh, radical branching, so, and radical quenching. So radical branching, radical plus, it goes to product one and theta radical worth, oh, sorry, the phi radical. The phi is the branching efficiency. So kind of like a stoichiometric coefficient. How many radicals do we form? Termination is where radical just goes to product. P1 and P2 are non-reactive products. So just looking at that, Ki, AB is going to form the radicals. KB is radical. And so that's, uh, that's our second step. And theta, oh, sorry, phi, KB, radical B is going to be a formation of new radicals. So even though this is consuming radicals in the second term, third term is forming new radicals and termination. So 
for simplicity's sake, we're going to combine all these together to say this was lambda, I think. Where lambda is KAB, KIAB. This is going to be initial amount. And K effective is going to be KB phi minus one minus KT. So those aren't going to really change. So integrating this for time, we see that our, the radical concentration is going to be more like our lambda or the K effective E, K effective T minus one. So imagine two scenarios. So if termination is much, much faster than KB theta over theta minus one, or the reverse. If termination is much, much faster, much, much faster, much, much greater, as, as T approaches infinity, infinity we essentially have negative kt, so e to the negative number is going to be close to zero. And you have what essentially negative kt, so zero minus one, negative one times negative one, and so you have limit, you essentially have our lambda over kt. Lambda is so essentially, what's the reaction rate? The, the concentration of radicals are equal just to our initial steps, our initial concentration over KT. But if we say that KB, the essentially formation efficiency is, uh, or for, formation efficiency is much greater than KT. So you have KB formation efficiency, whatever minus KT is our K effective. So E to the K effective, so you E to the essentially really big number, is essentially infinity, is a really big number minus one. You can almost ignore that. And then we have really big number on bottom. K to essentially as T, well, T approaches infinity there, this approach of E to the infinity approaches infinity. And so infinity minus one is still infinity, infinity times that. So essentially the thermal run we have our branching, chain branching explosion right there. We're saying essentially if the branching efficiency is greater than the termination efficiency, the amount of radicals approaches infinity as time approaches infinity which is why we have our explosions. We're gonna go ahead and stop there. Uh, last video, we're gonna finish up with photochemistry, chemistry of light in terms of kinetics.